Okay, we're shifting scale now uh, from um, product design to architecture. We're going to hear from Alistair Parvin. He's a designer with Zero Zero in London. And although he trained and practices in architecture, his work extends outside its traditional framework. He looks at the economic, social, and technological systems behind it. He's a co-founder of WikiHouse, an open source construction system which is using digital manufacturing to make it possible for almost anyone to download, adapt, and print structures which they can quickly assemble for themselves. Aside from his design projects, Alistair has written for numerous architectural design and policy journals. He's lectured widely and participated in government advisory forums on urban development, architecture, housing policy, and strategic design. So please welcome Alistair, who will be talking about open source architecture. Thank you very much, Adil. Thank you. Um, so when I was coming over here uh, yesterday, um, I sort of decided to completely change the talk. Um, so uh, if it appears messy and incoherent, I apologize. And to the brilliant lady up in the box, if my talk is rubbish, just give a better one. Um, <laughs> so what I wanted to do is actually, in a way, I'm quite pleased that I, I changed track because uh, Thomas has just given probably the best possible description of the dynamics of open, open source hardware and open source projects. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about the driving forces behind projects like WikiHouse, uh, the big kind of shifts that are taking place. And they're happening anyway, even if you hate what, um, WikiHouse and you hate what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's very weird, isn't it, how we all seem to be agreed that we're moving towards this data-driven city, towards, um, and we all agreed on this, but no one seems to agree on what it's for these technologies you know one moment you're hearing that we're going to sort of have citizens with apps and the next moment we're going to be living in this uh, sort of social networked situation in which we're all super efficient consumers and um, serendipity can be engineered that's an actual quote um, or the next we're going to be uh, you know how open government open data is going to be given to these privatized infrastructures um, to be radically efficient, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, through it all, there's this kind of weird gap, and, and you can't quite put your finger on why it feels a bit weird and doesn't really touch, hit, hit the spot, really. Um, partly, it's this kind of weird second-hand Silicon Valley thing, isn't it? Um, and I think uh, Cedric Price put this most brilliantly um, with this question here, which is actually, we tend to over-focus on the affordances and potentials of new technology, but we under-focus on the ownership and governance structures behind them and the dynamics of them. Um, and uh, for those of you who might have come across me talking before, you'll know that my kind of way into that was to do a simple piece of logic about what are we doing? Who are we actually working for? And so I kind of took a, went through a process where I said, well, my starting salary is supposedly an arch architecture graduate is supposed to be 24,000 pounds, which if you map that onto the entire population of the world, puts you in the richest 1.95% people in the world. Um, now, given the architecture's current situation where you have to hire an architect for some period of time, this only confirms what we already know, which is that actually everything that we call architecture is the business of designing for the richest 1% of individuals, corporations, and organizations, whether that's the state or the, the market. And, um, you know, and, and sure, that was sort of welfare state through much of the, the 60s and 70s, but for most of us now, it's real estate. Architecture is basically capital now. That's what we do. And if you want to know what that graph actually looks like in real life, this is not an empty slide. This is actually the graph of who builds the houses in, in Britain. Um, it's so, so all of them along the bottom, and then how many they built up the, up the axis doesn't even fit on the screen. In, in this, this is 2006. In that year, more than 50% of all the houses built in Britain were made by just 10 companies. Um, 
that's this massive consolidation of, of capital. That's actually who we work for. Now, obviously, this is um, has some. It would seem like I'm making an ethical point, but this is also a straightforward business point. Architecture's market share is rubbish. Actually, architecture is. We're facing these incredible, huge design sort of problems that they are recognized the design problems, climate change, urbanization, dependence on fossil fuels, and yet actually architecture is completely marginal and peripheral. Um, because of those economics, only about 2% of the buildings in the world have anything to do with architects. Um, and the truth is that although architecture often makes this, likes to stylistically kind of praise vernaculars, Fundamentally, it has always been basically ambivalent to the generic, copied, um, ad hoc architecture generated by the social and real economy, which actually constitutes most cities through most of history. Um, all huge credit goes to those architects like, um, and designers, you know, Jane Jacobs, Mockby, um, Cameron, Sinclair, People like that who recognize this, who spotted it. This is this, this massive kind of gap between architecture, what architecture was and what it could, should be doing. Um, so yeah, essentially architecture has become this kind of all in the left-hand world over here, this game of articulating real estate. If you are an architect right now, um, hands up by the way, if those who are in architecture, is that okay? Um, if you're a young architecture right now, you're probably, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, your job is probably to make a tiny number of white middle-aged men a bit richer. Um, that's actually what we're doing by creating real estate cities designed as real estate. And unfortunately, this is what falls out the edge. Um, and yet, weirdly, at the same time, architecture is vastly underperforming in tackling these design challenges. But at the same time, we're still clinging on to this kind of weirdly Victorian business model of being a designer, where effectively, an unpaid intern sits down the road at a drawing board, drawing this tiny detail, and down the road another unpaid intern s sits at a drawing board doing the same detail. And that detail's been done many times before, better. Um, all because they're not sharing what we know. And so we're kind of struggling. So what, are, what is gonna happen? What are the big economic shifts that are going to start hitting architecture? Um, and the big one, I think the best definition uh, for this has come from um, Jeremy Rifkin, who Simone mentioned earlier, which is uh, effectively what he identified is, is a kind of paradox within capitalism, which is that what capitalism does is it's continually seeking to drive down the margin, marginal cost. That is to say, the amount of money that's required to replicate um, a good once, it's, it's been once you have it. Um, and this can be reflected in, uh, actually, Simone's graphs are much better. Um, you know, the price of 3D printers or the price of all kinds of things. Um, and actually, uh, technology's been doing that for a very long period of time, driving down the marginal cost of production to as low as possible to include as many people as possible. And then suddenly, with the web, it hit this, this point, where suddenly, the marginal cost of distributing goods could become zero. So where Henry Ford's great success was that he managed to drive down the marginal cost to a point where the middle classes could afford his, his product, um, the web created the situation where uh, suddenly uh, Kodak were in trouble because you could download stuff for free. So we know this story. It's been happening for the last 10, 20 years. Um, where people are suddenly unwilling to pay for a thing because they realize they can effectively copy it for free um, elsewhere. And so uh, the legal battles ensue. The same thing happened to the music industry. And what these things do is actually, it's not just that they make these things kind of contested, uh, but actually also that it unlocks this production of the social economy. So it breaks this idea that only, the only people who can produce are the few big companies and the rest of us are just consumers. Um, and although we may mostly use this for making videos of kittens, um, it obviously has had a profound impact on our industry, industry and, and culture. And really, all that's happening is that that pattern, which we're very familiar with, is hitting stuff. And it's, that's, where it, that's where it's been coming. And this is uh, one of our kind of favorite quotes 
um, which we attribute, we think, to John Maynard Keynes, um, which pretty much perfectly sums up what this means for design, what's going to happen next. Um, and the interesting thing about this quote is it's blindingly obvious, but it's not how our industrial economy works. Uh, our industrial economy currently works on the basis that uh, a designer, probably in a polo neck and trendy glasses, um, produces a, a, a recipe, um, protects it like hell, and then sends it all the way around the world, probably to a factory in China, which is the, where the cheapest labor is available, who uh, produce that project, uh, product, uh, put it on a ship, and uh, send it all the way back here, where we uh, put it in a shopping mall and get out our credit card and take on some debt. Brilliant. Um, of course, the real power of digital fabrication suddenly makes it possible to say, actually, uh, what if it's now possible for someone to share that recipe and anyone anywhere to download it um, and, and print it for themselves at home? Um, the first thing you can expect is some pretty major legal battles to ensue, and that's already begun. But of course, what's happening inevitably is that that's coming into architecture. So digital fabrication is moving into architecture so we can expect to see more and more of this stuff, which is the ability to 3D print buildings. But as ever, the question is, what, what's the question? So actually, this, if what this does is creates this situation where recipes simultaneously become the most valuable thing in the world, but also want to be free. And it, create, it will primarily be used by big companies who will be able to use it to effectively uh, demonetize labor, labor on the construction site. So you'll be able to have a, a relationship where a, a developer company can pretty much click manufacture on a series of small concrete boxes, and they don't need to pay anybody anything um, to build them. So the other big shift that's being driven by this is the rise of automation. Again, that's being mentioned. Um, this effectively, this, uh, the, the automation of, of middle class, relatively repetitive, but relatively skilled, but repetitive labor. Um, and that's going to be huge. I call this the kind of John Henry story, you know, the second time around. If we thought that the automation of working class labor was a big p political story with the rise of the trade unions, just wait until it's the middle classes who, who are on the line. So with organizations like Google, yeah, taxi drivers are screwed. I mean, in a way, it's amazing seeing the taxi drivers can arguing against Uber, because this is the real threat for Uber. So we've got these automation tools that can actually begin to deal with incredibly complex tasks. So this is a thing called associative design, which was produced by someone at the Belago Institute, who I've never met, but I think this is a completely brilliant piece of work. So I'm, I'm showing it here. Um, articulating the potentials of these sorts of parametric automation technologies um, to radically lower the thresholds to performing complex tasks. So, yeah, we've already covered that. So what's happening here is effectively this, which is so simultaneously we're gaining access to all these amazing free, uh, to, to all these amazing free services and capabilities, but at the same time, uh, labor is being drawn away. So what we're seeing is a net demonetization of the economy. Um, now, on one level, you could say that that's completely amazing, we get all this free stuff, but you could also say that this sounds uh, pretty dystopian. It, it echoes very powerfully with um, Thomas Piketty's vision of a society in which um, we have a kind of huge class of super prosumers, but actually everything is owned by a tiny minority of companies um, elsewhere. Um, so the question that really lies at the heart of this is, well, what does capital do next? When, when, when this starts happening, when labor is effectively demonetized, when the, pr the marginal production cost goes down to zero, where does capital go? Because capital always goes somewhere. And I think basically broadly what's happening is that it's going into two major areas. Um, one, into the hard scarcities, which is land and materials and two into the kind of soft assets, which is data and IP. And these four areas are the legal battlegrounds of the 21st century. It's already begun, and I bet you can think of examples for all of them. Um, we, we can expect a, a time pretty soon when Apple will refuse to sell us a device um, because of the materials inside it. They've already started buying up their supply chains. IKEA, Apple, they're all doing this. 
Um, they will refuse to sell us a device because they're saying we're not going to let you own the materials inside this, so we will rent it to you. So again, it's that vision, that Piketty vision of a kind of rentier society where um, we all have access to a whole load of stuff, but actually all of, the, all of the, the core assets are owned by a tiny number of companies in Silicon Valley. Um, and of course, the, the, the one that we're most familiar with is this issue of data uh, and IP. We are well into this era of data capitalism now, and we saw that very clearly with um, Google's purchase of Nest for however many billion pounds. You know, no one was naive enough to think that what they were buying there was the designs um, or that even the design team. What they were buying was access to all that personal data. Um, so actually, when we're talking about open, uh, again, as Simone said earlier, we tend to focus very hard on IP, on patents and copyrights, and uh, that's right. But actually, we're going to have to address this, all of these areas. Because actually what we're witnessing is um, a pretty familiar pattern through history. It might sound kind of incredibly scary, but actually we've seen this before, which is that technology creates a new domain and the legal framework takes a while to catch up. So for a brief period of time, the technology companies have absolute supremacy and they do whatever they want. We saw it with homesteading, mining rights, air rights. Air rights in the UK were only invented after um, the American air bases had all been installed in the war, and so it became an issue. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's happening now with, with data. You get to a point where the tensions between the, those companies and citizens, or between those companies, the government and citizens, or even between the companies and each other, can no longer be sustained. Um, and it boils over. And at some point, somebody says, um, we need a, a new kind of Magna Carta. And, and that's also the key argument. The arguments against this stuff are not just ethical, they're also practical. So this is what this looks like in hardcore terms. This is Kiamba Kiaxi, oh, say it right, um, in Angola. So this is a city made completely from scratch as a kind of real estate city in the desert um, by Chinese financial capital. And the kind of crazy thing is that for a long period of time, it's sat mostly empty because you need a mortgage to buy the flat. And so they have these kind of cleaners kind of tending to, and sort of building and, and gardeners tending to the lawns. And, you know, the journal, this is great things of journalists going up to them and saying, well, what do you think of it here? And it's, oh, it's, it's really nice. Uh, there's no crime. <laughs> um, where do you live? Oh, well, uh, I live here. So actually, the first thing is it just doesn't stack up. Um, but the second thing is also, actually, before long, the lack of a civic framework begins to become intolerable. And so sooner or later, uh, we realize we're going to have to write civic frameworks around these things. We're going to have to have contracts around data. We're going to have to have new civic frameworks around these things. And um, the key thing is that when those civic frameworks emerge, we tend we tend to overfocus, or we tend to get incredibly preoccupied by the protest movements. Um, and actually, or uh, then from the protest movements, we focus on government. And actually, those are the two in, sort of areas probably least likely to be able to affect serious change. What again and again seems to be the case is that when those civic frameworks emerge, they emerge um, from kind of civic leaders who essentially come up with a new model that makes the old one obsolete. Uh, they come up with a new way of operating um, which outperforms the old one because it's more efficient, it's more trusted. Um, it's a better neutral space for people to part participate. And again, this isn't news. Like we, we know, we, we've seen this already. So actually, uh, Wikipedia very quickly managed to outperform um, things like Encarta and Britannica. Uh, Creative Commons uh, and indeed o open source licenses in general, th the main, one of the main arguments or the main reasons for their success is not because a whole load of people believed in them, because actually fundamentally they were better in tune with the, cor with the way we wanted to work and the way we, we could collaborate with each other. Um, so the, effectively we're creating, what, what are being created there are prototype new civic frameworks, and if they get the design right, then people pick up 
on them and they start growing and scaling and they become the norm. So, and, and I mean, Creative Commons is now absolutely established as a kind of sharing um, licensing system for all kinds of media on the web. So, in a way, Wikihouse, what I'm kind of arguing is that um, Wikihouse was really inevitable. Uh, we didn't have to do it, in a way. We did it because we were really, we, or we began it because we were really, really interested in it. But actually, the only real decision was to say these shifts are happening anyway. It doesn't matter whether you're, it's irrelevant if you say I'm for automation or I'm against automation, it doesn't matter. It's happening anyway. So the decision that we face is to ask ourselves, what does an equitable society and a successful, prosperous economy look like given that it is happening? And so that's the real potential revolution um, behind this idea, is this idea that actually uh, the capacity to produce and the tools of production can be truly democratized in a much more real sense this idea of the factory being everywhere. So suddenly we can be an environment where, which we've already talked about, one person can produce one set of design, another person can take it, download it anywhere they like, but they can improve it and adapt it um, and send it back to somebody else somewhere else uh, producing something. So effectively doing the same thing um, for blueprints as Wikipedia has done for knowledge, to literally say that design solutions can become common knowledge in the true sense of the word. And, and that's exactly what these sorts of platforms are trying to build, is effectively what is the structure that hosts that, both in terms of the digital platform, but also in terms of the good governance, the good ownership behind it, um, that allows all of these participants to collaborate and trust each other, and actually also to effectively exchange knowledge. Because one of the other kind of hidden, if you like, unknowns is that it's very easy to take a piece of code and copy it and paste it in without fully understanding what that piece of code is. It's a completely fungible object. That's not necessarily the case for physical things. So you need to have uh, common languages. So when we overlay this ability to effectively create this central commons for um, shared intellectual property, we overlay that with the potential, and this is a very, very early kind of hack, with the potential to develop um, these parametric tools to it's not just about openness in terms of the licenses that we apply, but actually using these two tools to realize their potential, to radically lower thresholds of time and cost and skill required to do much, much more complex tasks. So the aim of WikiHouse is, yes, to make it possible for anybody to download a house, but actually, ultimately also, to make it possible for anybody with very little skill to begin to take that house and adapt that design for their particular place around a particular set of um, rules and limits. And from that, auto to uh, generate pretty much uh, at a few clicks um, a set of cutting files, which takes all the parts from that model, lays them all out onto a sheet and numbers them. Um, and Using this machine, which is a CNC machine, which I expect most of you are familiar with, they're pretty wide, they're increasingly widely available. Um, and any standard sheet material uh, like plywood um, can effectively take those cutting files and begin to cut out all these parts for a house. And they have within those parts nested all the complexity. So the piece essentially is a big kit. Um, and the kit can then be assembled much more quickly and much more simply than traditional construction can be. So we use these kind of wedge and peg connections. Uh, the original parts of which are actually strongly borrowed from 14th century Japanese um, vernacular. Um, and we haven't heard from their lawyers yet, so we think that's fine. Um, and to assemble this, now this seems incredibly nice, but, uh, this kind of idea of, oh, I can, I can incredibly quickly and incredibly simple, simply construct this very high performance house. Um, but actually, what's more interesting is that actually it, it, it takes a huge amount of hard-nosed thinking to go into this problem of how do you actually design down those thresholds of time and cost and difficulty. So this um, Japanese design concept of poker yoke, which means um, foolproofing, making a, a part impossible to get wrong, or um, actually designing into the system around things like safety standards. Um, so in this case, we're looking at um, doing our uh, second story house where the handrails for the second story are built into the first story so you can eliminate the need for scaffolding but ensure that essentially amateurs on a construction site um, are still safe throughout the process. 
Um, and so this is the video, and I, and, and I genuinely mean this when I say that the design target for the system is to generate systems which can be built by a team with a level of organization equivalent to a piss up in a brewery. That's actually the objective, is to make everything from the naming through to the system as simple and as hard to get wrong as possible. Um, and you can begin to see this kind of, uh, the speed of that process. Um, and the, the huge amounts of, of iteration that are required to get each one of those joints working in the absolute best way. Um, in a way, open source is another way of saying that you can download a piece of information that has embedded within it thousands of hours worth of design resolution. So without really having to understand it, you can instantly uh, get something that works beautifully. And then, of course, you that that get to that arrival point where you have a, a, a chassis of a house, um, and you begin to realize, no, hold on a minute, you know, it's more than that. So uh, the ability of the house to be completely modular and interoperable um, in the way that uh, Thomas was already talking about, um, so that we can begin to have plug and play services that allow people to adapt and hack and change that house in future. Um, and also as far as possible to make the system to some extent aesthetically agnostic. Um, so you can, make it, it, this, un, un, you can make it look like whatever you want it to look like. There isn't a kind of uh, thing here about architects saying you, oh, it must look the way we want it to. So that's our kind of objective. And so after sort of several years of, or oh, three years almost, of, of prototyping and iterating and beginning from the slow beginnings of this project, we're very shortly going to be arriving at the point where we'll build the first full um, certified high-performance house, which hopefully will be possible to build for about 40 to 50K, um, and you know, meets all the standards. So these are, these are kind of levels, of levels of performance, we hope, that at the moment you have to go to a very expensive German construction company to be able to get in terms of energy performance. But the other, of course, most important thing is that getting there, over time, we as the founding team become less and less important. So we've opened up the WikiHouse trademark under a certain license and everything, um, as well as the IP. And now there are, I think, 14, this is out of date, there are 14 um, chapters in various uh, different stages um, around the world who are beginning to take and, and tinker and hack that. It's very hard to know exactly how big the community is. Um, but we think it's probably at the moment somewhere in the region about 50 to 60 people um, working part-time or full-time on uh, WikiHouse development. And these prototypes spring out. I mean, I could talk about this forever. forever. The first kind of point you would ask here is, well, hold on a minute, what about plywood? Isn't plywood expensive? Of course it is. We start somewhere, and, and, but actually it's this process of beginning to fork and adapt and change like Darwin species, the products, so they begin to adapt to their local uh, neighborhoods and variations. So actually what we're talking about, these principles begin to be applied to many, many different types of digital manufacturing and design processing. Um, so really what we're developing here is the kind of first kernel for what could ultimately be seen as vernacular. The only difference between vernacular architecture and open source architecture is speed and the web. And the other big aspect of this, or if you like, the big kind of expansion of this idea is to realize that, of course, a house is a useful character, a sort of carrier. Everyone sees the house and they kind of write this as a physical house, but actually... The real power, the real problems of this actually lie in the whole system of house. Um, so the end project, really what we're working on, and not just us but many people, is effectively this. It's to develop low, low cost, high performance design solutions to not just the problem of structure but to uh, um, each one of those kind of module, uh, each one of those parts, and you'll be able to look at different ones and say, actually, I know a team who's working on that. I know a team who's working on that. All we have to do is begin to make sure that we're collaborating, um, making them interoperable as far as possible, and effectively, continually generating these solutions and putting their comments. Now, the potential of that is huge. When we look at the big, those big design challenges of urbanization, um, we know that, for example, in the next few decades, hundreds of millions of people are going to be joining the middle classes in India and China, and they're going to want to use air conditioning. So actually, if we're really serious about tackling these sorts of solutions, about tackling these problems, one of the smartest things we could be doing is developing open source solar powered air conditioning as a design solution and diffusing it as rapidly as possible. 
um, into this system. That is an extraordinary contribution to take the design solutions for all of those things and to effectively say from now on they are common knowledge. They are a birthright of every human being on earth, the ability to know that, the ability to make high-performance off-grid sanitation, for example. But also, just in case you're about to go, this guy's a complete utopian kind of nutter, um, it's also really, really sensible for us as designers. Not out of altruism did Tesla recently uh, open up all their patents. They did it because they realized that, that as, they, as they said in, in, in the, the piece that they wrote at the time, they did it because they realized that their competitor wasn't another, other electric car companies, their competitor was gasoline. And similarly, architecture's competitor is not other architects, it's no architects at all. So actually, using commons, building these commons, are a way for architecture to become radically more efficient and much more effective as a force for design in the world, um, to effectively expand our market share beyond the 2%. But in order to do it, we need to be looking beyond the technologies themselves to the kind of civic framework behind that. And I look to... Um, amazing examples in history, like Benjamin Franklin, who was a prolific inventor. Um, of course, he never patented any of his inventions because he believed that knowledge, if, if it was any good, it needed to be out there and diffused, and that was his main objective. Um, and also, he invented things like the fire brigades. He introduced the America's first fi civic fire brigade. So what he was doing as a designer is being to step outside of the idea that I, as a designer, um, just a person, an artist, or just a person trying to make money, to realizing that actually the real power of design is to look out the windscreen and see a problem and try and solve that problem, um, and then try and find a way to earn a living by doing it. And effectively, therefore, the challenge that we're working on here is, is democracy. But we need to take the word democracy or democratization very, very carefully, because it's getting overused and arguably occasionally corrupted. You know, in its traditional sense, the word democracy derives, as we know, from demos kratos, meaning people, power. It is not a form of government. Um, we tend to see it as this form of government and then go black and white, so we draw this map of the world that says, oh, you're democratic, you're not. And actually, the truth is that even in supposedly democratic societies, development is still something done to, not done by citizens, because we still fundamentally believe that only large organizations, corporations or the state, can produce and manufacture these things on our behalf. Actually, there's no reason why that distributed power shouldn't be the power to produce, the power of knowledge, the power of ownership, um, even literally electrical power, energy. And in order to get that right, we need to be looking behind the technology to those civic and legal frameworks around, the, around those four kinds of capital, land, uh, materials, data, and intellectual property. In other words, for us as designers, we need to change the question. Thanks. Or heckles. Yeah. Hi, Alistair. Thank you. That was very uh, eloquently put. Um, but here, here's the here's the puzzle. So I'm actually one of probably one of the privileged or suffering person who is building a house in, mm -hmm. in London. Yeah. And um, a couple of months ago... Well done ago, for getting a piece of land. Uh, a couple of months ago, I had a friend who said, oh, you should talk to my friend Alistair. He's doing an, uh, building the open source house. And there's me dying of having a runaway typical cowboy builder. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, so I really understand the theory of what, what you're saying step by step. I really get it. But I'd like to know more about how it really applies to the wiki house because it feels to me, from my um, experience, that the architects, 
they, they actually earn very little money from the actual design, the decisions, but it's the amount of time it takes. So it's not looking at the house as a, uh, as a thing of parts or a thing of an, you know, blah, there you go, but a four months long laborious process of, you know, dealing with UK power networks and water yep. supplies and waiting for council and signing contracts and making sure that builders right by the right place. These are, so building a house is like a time of trauma. It's not, um, it's not a, a theory applied to um, a, a piece of design. And this, is, this is one of the powers of to producing a system rather than a product, right? Is that the system can have embedded within it huge levels of complexity that would take months and months to actually work through a given thing. So for example, you can develop a system in that, yes, can try to design down certain um, particular barriers. So you can take certain problems off the table that you might encounter to do with, say, party wall agreements by having a construction system that doesn't engage with the neighboring wall or, or has a smarter way of doing foundations. So actually, we're kind of beginning to kind of work those through. But actually, your fundamental point is a better one, which is that actually constructing the house is only a tiny bit of the challenge, certainly in uh, sort of Western economies. Um, and strangely, can I go back to that, my previous slide, is that possible? Um, uh, strangely, uh, that may be one of the most interesting elements for that, for the parametric design element, is if you like to change, begin to change the way that we do legals and certification. Because the straightforward thing with open source is if we get a single building through building regulations, well, and so one person makes one change, is it still certified? So actually the fundamental power of those parametric tools is that you can begin to have rules-based certification and potentially rules-based planning. So actually, uh, uh, Wellington, the capital city of New Zealand, I believe I'm right in saying, have WikiHouse formally on their housing policy framework. Um, and the thing they're most interested in, I think, apart from uh, the potential to recover their suburbs using the social economy in the event of an earthquake, um, is actually this ability to say, using these rules-based systems, we can actually make much more light-touch regulation around certification and planning. Now, there is a bigger project there. Um, I don't, I'm going to be able to get there, but I'm, yeah. Um, there is a kind of bigger project there as well, which before uh, we were working on WikiHouse, I worked on a, a, a sort of piece of research called A Right to Build. And in a way, it was focused on the UK, and it was almost everything but making the house. Mm -hmm. And strangely, what they're doing is converging. So what we're actually looking at is this problem of why is it so hard to buy a piece of land? Um, in the UK, and why is the, the, the framework, the, the, if you like, the administrative overhead of building, uh, no, but that is also a design problem. The one thing that design is really, really good at is making stuff easier. And actually, if you look at the, uh, the kind of these platforms like Google, uh, et cetera, et cetera, their, 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 their real power is they made, sh they made stuff so much easier. That's all, I mean, there was nothing more complicated than that. So actually, we can use these, if we can use the same methods, the same techniques, to lower thresholds in, if you like, mundane civic life, right. like the ability to buy a plot of land and build a house, we can sort of make huge leaps forward. And of course, it's the Dutch who are, are really leading the way on that stuff right now. So uh, in places like um, Horam's Courtier in Almere, they have a situation where your planning permission is given to you as a two page of A4, um, which is extraordinary, right? Like, and I always can say, our, the current planning systems that we have, and I believe it's the same over here in Barcelona, but you can correct me if this is wrong, is still a sort of applications-based. So, like, if you want to do something, you have to send a set, get a set of drawings made and by an architect and send them in and say, am I allowed to do this? I would say, if you did that for a game of football, it would be ridiculous. Like, so I'm not going to tell you what the rules of the game are, but you start playing, and I'll let you know if you're allowed to do what you're doing as you go along. The only reason we do that is because... Um, we did, uh, our planning system was invented before the internet. Uh, um, uh, so actually, now that we have the internet, we might as well use it um, to start saying, actually, we could have much clearer rules-based planning and really think about a right to build. And a right isn't just a government confer. They say, oh, legally, you're allowed to write. A right is something that has to be engineered. I, it has to be made. You have to have the capability um, to do it. So, yeah. I, I get what you're saying about clarity, um, but would you actually say things like rule-based um, negotiation? You know, these are oh, rule-based um, weekly checkups. Who would be guiding uh, the everyday person through this system? 
uh, what is the role of an architect? Would he then be the person playing with the... Th there's two questions in your question. Yeah. Uh, the first one, yeah, I'd say we've just uh, surely be publishing a, a little uh, think book we wrote about the first half of your question. Um, and actually, yes, it is about um, setting protocols and institutions in place that really kind of make it much more transparent and clear who, you know, who can you know, give people help or is it if you've got this question or whatever it is. Um, so that's, a, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a total bailout on that answer because it's such a long answer um, as to how you design a process beautifully to make sure that there's a really, s to lower the transaction costs, to take as many problems as possible off the table in the first place. So, for example, uh, co-housing co groups or community uh, self-builders, one mistake they commonly try to make is they try to design the whole thing together and therefore they end up in arguments with each other because actually you don't want someone designing over your, designing your door handles. Um, so actually, a, the, it's a, partly a game of apportioning the correct decision to the correct scale. So there's a whole load of stuff in there. The question of the role for architects is an infinitely more, in a way, irrelevant, but also for us, interesting one. Um, because actually, I think it will begin to fragment. So one is that architects will begin to become really good at what they do do, which is providing sort of services in this production economy of making a house. So let's say you bought a plot of land, you were a, rise, a, a sort of a raising open economy of companies, and that's of course what Wikihouse Platform aims to support, is this open economy of people selling their design services or their manufacturing capabilities to, 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 have to provide the best service for understanding you, designing you a house, and delivering that house. Um, but also, of course, what architects are doing is yeah, moving upstream into the design of those systems and processes themselves. And what's interesting is that architects say, sometimes say, oh, no, I don't do that, I just do buildings. But if you actually follow them around the office all day and listen to what they do and read their emails, huge amount of their work is actually that stuff um, anyway. So actually, it's just about us getting real with it, get, getting real that that's actually where our skill lies. First of all, thank you very much, Esther. And I've been trying to formulate this question in a way that I don't get everybody messed up here. Um, the design from WikiHouse, it, it looks like a very Western house. Mm -hmm. And then you showed all the pictures of the ghetto in Angola and the first one, I don't know where it was. And then you talked, or before, I know you talked about um, the consumer turning into the producer. Mm -hmm. um, did you go and look at all those people that lived in the ghettos where they are the producers and where they have been being their own architects since well, forever. Yeah. Um, and also working as a commune because if you go into one of those big building blocks you saw designed by the architect and you go into these ghettos, you will notice there is a common and probably the house next door, you help building it. When the roof fell, it fell on top of yours, yours so you yeah. had to go next door and fix the roof next door because it's on top of yours. So what do you think we have to learn? And what are the, the paradigms between this Western model where we actually have a surplus of housing? Mm -hmm. We don't, but yeah. Uh, well, there's people in the street and there's mm -hmm. empty buildings, at least yeah. here in Spain. I don't know what's happening, but I don't, I don't want to go longer, I just want to ask you that. Have you gone and, and researched and see how that social and, and social structure, common structure, works into this architecture of the ghetto? Um, and how this ghetto... I, I, ha I have a bit, but not a lot. And, not, and I would never even, even if I'd done twice as much as I'd done, I would never pretend to be an expert. One of the principles we have built into WikiHouse is, because there's this dilemma of, oh, if I can't do everything, maybe I should do nothing. So actually, one of the principles we have is actually don't design for, you know, people you've never met in context you don't understand the environment. Actually solve the problem you have here and then let people fork it and adapt it and say, well, that doesn't work here. So the system we have right now, it, it not only looks like it's designed for Western, it is designed for Western economies because it works really well in economies where um, labor is re relatively expensive but materials are relatively cheap. Africa is the opposite situation. So, uh, so I often find myself saying, if a, if a wiki house in Johannesburg looks the same as a, a wiki house in things, something's gone terribly wrong. Um, 
so that and that's an interesting point. But hopefully, it kind of you get you get the idea that it's just this idea of start somewhere, start start a kernel, and begin to. Yeah. The ultimate open materials are things like earth, probably, and there's some interesting experiments around that. Um, recycled waste plastics, because everybody seems to have loads of them. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a whole kind of other area of exploration. Um, your other side of uh, the kind of question. Remind me what the second part was about, because it was more interesting. I've forgotten. Yeah, it's, it's how the ghetto builds. Yeah, it's it's its own architect as a commune. Yes, exactly. So, and this is this cool thing about again, what's the dispersion mechanism? Is that even though uh, we we must be very very hesitant when we're talking about the slums because there's been such a bad history of people romanticizing the slums, etc. Um, and even though they're completely different situations, weirdly, the longer I research it, the long the more I begin to see that actually our housing crisis here and a housing crisis there are not so different from each other. It's just that they experience it as deprivation, whereas we experience it as debt. That's actually what's going on with our housing system. It's called because of the land economy. We don't have a housing surplus. Um, so actually, uh, the crises are incredibly similar. And therefore, weirdly, having invested loads and loads of time into designing that neighborhood design process, which begins with the, the community factory or fab lab, as also becomes the seed institution for connecting with the local people, for, for once having a form of development led by citizens that doesn't expect a political tabula rasa. And so in beginning to do all the work that we're looking at, which hopefully I'll be speaking about next week, um, uh, effectively to have D development done by the many with a bit instead of the few with a lot. Um, the more we do it focused on the UK problem, the more we keep stepping back or people keep saying, oh, actually, it's not so different um, over here in Rio or wherever they are in the sense that the diffusion mechanism looks pretty similar. Um, and actually, they, I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that has actually begun to emerge, um, as you say, in a lot of informal cities, you get these either marketized or non-marketized tool pools or central locations which begin to act as these kind of making institutions anyway, just with very poor quality resources and very poor quality design solutions. So uh, the kind of aim of that is to say, actually, ironically, it might turn out that that informal city, which is driven by the social economy and the real economy rather than the real estate debt economy, um, might, end, is, might end up being a way more sustainable, um, sociable, uh, and successful, economically prosperous form of urbanism. But we have to find a way to make it scalable, um, regulatable, give it institutions, uh, et and to make the design output very high quality and very sustainable. Is that a reasonable answer? Yeah, of course. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. I found the project really interesting. Actually, didn't know it. Uh, I have um, a question uh, about the 3D printing with mm -hmm. the wiki house. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, um, what is exactly the value that the 3D, the 3D printing adds to the wiki house, and whether if whether it's necessary to to have the house printed in with a 3D yeah. printer, yeah. and you know because I have doubt in terms of accessibility and heavy infrastructures and sustainability. Yep. So I don't know if you can talk so a little bit more a, about I, that. I, I mean, that is an amazing question. I mean, it's the question. Because of course, that's been, the answer is it's been around. There's open source construction has been, there's many, like non-digitized, they've existed. Um, and they've got to a point where they should scale more, but they don't seem to have scaled more. And I wonder why. Partly it's because the thing that you need to end up with needs to look like what is conservatively called a desirable house in that area. Um, but the real advantage that digital manufacturing brings is um, th this thing about lowering thresholds. Because if you think about it, it's fundamentally about complexity. It turns the physical structure into a piece of code. So in the same way that with an open source code, I can download a piece of code, I don't really understand how all the things that it does the thousands of hours that have thought that have gone in by so many thousands of people and however people into it, um, I, it works. So I can just download it and it works. And so what that does is it takes a whole load of um, 
knowledge and skill off the table that I no longer need to have. The other thing is also, fundamentally, it means you no longer need to have that skill around joints, so it rapidly speeds up construction. Now, speeding up construction isn't a disruption. It's not just a kind of, hey, we built this in a day or two. Oh, isn't that glamorous? It's actually a real thing like that, because I can't say to my friend, hey, can you come and help me build a house for a month? They'll say, no, I'm busy, so hire a builder. Oh, man, I'm going to have to save up more money or take out a bigger mortgage. Um, whereas I could say to a group of 10 friends, uh, hey, can you all come over for the weekend? I'll provide drinks and pizza. Can you help me build a house? And they're like, wicked, that sounds better than what we had planned. And one of the strange things about when we do these wiki house build prototypes is we never have any problem. In fact, we are usually fighting off potential volunteers because people are like, oh, this is really fun. People love it and they have a really good time building. Um, and I'm not glamorizing work, it's still work, right? But fundamentally, um, by, a, by addressing those hard limits about people's time, and people's money and people's skill, um, you can actually lower those thresholds and move work, uh, you know, essentially liberate people in the social economy. Even straightforward things like um, having parts that can be lifted by a woman as well as a man. Actually, in a lot of traditional societies, a lot of construction was done by women. It was when they industrialized that construction became a man's thing. Um, uh, so largely, I mean, it's a generalization, but so even straightforward things like that to make sure that there isn't um, necessarily a gender advantage in the system between being a man or being a woman. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Thank, thanks for your talk. And I was thinking about the application of this system also in a context of a historical center and in consolidated city in the historical center, for example. In, and where, if you sorry? What? Where did you say so? I didn't catch you. Some, somewhere center. Historical center. Historical, historical centers, city sorry. center. Yes, sorry. Yes. And how do you think uh, this system can match with the refurbishment or can affect the um, change of the image of the city, in, especially for the historical center or consolidated systems? It sounds like you have a better idea of the answer than I do, actually. Um, uh, that sounds like a really interesting project. Please go and do it. Um, one, uh, there are obvious advantages, particularly when we start getting the parametric, scale, parametric capabilities actually working. Um, and uh, by the way, big shout out to all web developers and grasshopper experts. Um, if you're in the room and would like to work on that, please come and grab me. Um, uh, but actually, so one, uh, one example we've looked at is there's lots of old um, r ruins of barns and things like that. So the idea that we can make a planning protocol around those because it could very easily adjust to fit the exact um, situation of that and bring those old structures um, back into life while actually having a very high energy performance um, structure inside. But yeah, that's barely, just do it, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. You can carry on with the questions during lunch. Um, big round of applause for Alistair. Now, uh, break for lunch and reconvene here at 3 p.m. for the final panel session. <laughs>